Dan, let's talk about adoption. You mentioned adoption. Take a look at this chart. You've tweeted this chart before, and um, I'd like to get your take on this. So over there on the right-hand corner is Bitcoin all the way at the bottom. Um, adoption rate, what exactly is that referring to, uh, the, the y-axis? Is it the number of people in the world using Bitcoin? Is it the... Um, is it uh, the the is it uh, the life cycle of the uh, is it referring to the life cycle the product itself what what is that y axis referring to exactly? Yeah, the y axis would be um, survey data combined with uh, exchange account data. So that's basically how many people do we hypothesize have Bitcoin? It's hard to tell because there's not an exact mapping, so we come up with an estimate. So it's that okay. number divided by the global population. So oh, if we think about Bitcoin's, you know, Bitcoin's adoption curve, it's, it's very, very early um, in terms of these other technologies. Now, what's really interesting about Bitcoin is that it, it is bootstrapped on top of a very, very large network called the Internet. You know, uh, with that, that means that it's and, and what this chart also shows is that newer, newer technologies due to uh, how capitalism has improved the distribution of goods and services by a. Uh, various functions of like digitally on the internet or physically moving packages around much quicker that these technologies get adopted. And, uh, and that's why you see these, these lines, the, uh, the blue lines going to the orange and red lines, the newer lines in terms of adoption curves are becoming much steeper and that steepness reflects how quickly they can get, a, they become adopted. And so yes. with Bitcoin, we're at a very early stage for Bitcoin. I think a lot of people, when they look at Bitcoin's price, they think, Oh, I've, I've missed the boat. No, we, we're just getting started. If Bitcoin becomes widely adopted, its price won't be in the hundreds of thousands. It would be in the millions. And so we have a long ways to go. And that's, I think, what, what this chart that, distills that is very, my, very well. That is my next question is uh, how, how the adoption curve is correlated with the price growth. Can you comment on that? Yeah. So as I mentioned before, Bitcoin's price and adoption is somewhat, uh, somewhat intertwined. A money, after all is a collection of people, a network effect of those who believe in it. Uh, gold, Bitcoin, the dollar, they all work the same. It's a belief system. We trust the parameters that this money has. And we believe in this money and we believe in the value of this money due to its moneyness, how well it can do different money things. And that's where, for example, Bitcoin has some advantages over gold. With gold, you can't email it. It's not digitally native. It's physically native. Mm -hmm. Whereas Bitcoin is a digitally native asset. Also with gold, we don't know exactly how much gold is out there. We don't know how much gold will be produced, but with Bitcoin, we have extreme precision in knowing how much Bitcoin will ever be produced, 21 million. And we know uh, how much Bitcoin will be produced every single second. So we know to a very, very precise degree of how much ownership I have of Bitcoin, where if you have one Bitcoin, you know, you have exact, exactly one out of 21 million. And so Bitcoin, like these other monies, needed to come into existence. Uh, it wasn't going to be a linear uh, movement. It was going to be one in fits and starts. I mean, Bitcoin is challenging the status quo of gold and dollars. And these are hundred year old or multi-thousand year old beliefs or mindsets. So on this adoption curve, Bitcoin's price is what propels it forward because without that price, without us hearing about that price, Bitcoin would remain this niche thing that no one would hear about. And so Satoshi hypothesized that the innate nature of humans to speculate, to to be attracted to, uh, you know, the speculative investments would be the primary driver of Bitcoin's adoption. So Bitcoin's yeah. adoption in terms of price means that it's more liquid, means that there's more tools for people to use. And as a money, speculation isn't necessarily a bad thing because money, after all, is this belief system and people wanting to store value in it. Money's utility is, is the ability to store money in it and use it, et cetera. So, um, you know, people sometimes go, oh, well, the adoption of Bitcoin is separate from the price. And actually, I fundamentally disagree. It's it's the exact same thing because as it becomes larger in market capitalization, it becomes deeper in liquidity, it becomes easier to use. And also more people are, are in it and own Bitcoin, which is all tied together. So a few follow-up questions. First of all, why do you think that the curve for Bitcoin is different from some of the later uh, technological innovations like social media and tablets? You will see that Bitcoin has been flat throughout most of its history, and it's only in the last couple of years it started to ramp up in terms of adoption versus social media or, let's say, smartphones, which have basically started uh, you know, exponentially growing right away. Why is that? Yeah, it's a good question. So I think on... Um, part of that's also reflected in the early years. So 2010, yeah. 2011, not much happened. And same with 2012. Right. 
So it was a three year time period where things were a little bit slower and then things started to pick up. So if we were to, I think that made this chart about two years ago. So if we were to add a little bit more length to this, that, that line might be a little bit steeper. It hasn't been updated for the most recent cycle. I so I would say, um, you know, will it look just like these other, these other curves? Probably not. Yes. It could be, you know, we could see it go straight vertical or we could see it have little oscillating cycles and taking much longer because of money well, is, money is a, a, a very deep seated belief, right? Um, a lot of people still think that the dollar is backed by gold, which is pretty bizarre because it hasn't been for a long time now. And, you know, people don't want to wake up and challenge the nature of their reality and question, questioning the nature of the reality and going, what is money? And can I trust my government? Um, you know, these, these sort of realization moments only happen during COVID with money printer go burr and people going, oh, wait a second, what is my government doing with my money? Oh, this Bitcoin thing is a good alternative. So, yeah, I mean, it certainly may not look like those nice vertical lines for these newer technologies. It could be more of a fits and starts, or we could just see it go straight vertical where there are moments of extreme distrust with governments and everyone floods into Bitcoin at the same time. Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens and what plays out. What is your prognosis? Where do you see this curve headed? Is it going to go above 50%? Most of these most of these things have reached a hundred percent of adoption in the U.S. Except the newer things, they haven't they haven't gotten there yet. But so anyway, what do you think? What do you think Bitcoin is going to end up on this chart? Well, you know, Bitcoin. I think um, it depends on the cycles. So we're in the middle of a bull run right now, and these bull runs, Bitcoin adoption typically ten x's or hundred x's. So. You know, on this chart, we could see at the end of this bull run, Bitcoin potentially being representing uh, maybe 30 or 40 percent of uh, ownership percentage penetration in the U.S. Um, and in fact, yeah, this chart is a little bit out of date. I think the current percentages are close to like five to 10 percent of the okay. adult U.S. population owns Bitcoin, which is pretty okay. incredible. I mean, it, Bitcoin has no marketing team. Um, it, it merely just exists and survives long enough and then people start believing in it. So uh, five to 10% is, is actually pretty wild. And so I think that's where it's at today. But if the bull run continues, you know, we, I could see that very easily hitting between like 20 and 30% at the end of this bull run, maybe even 40%, um, which then that line starts to look straight vertical. Well, I guess the question, well, there's, there's a couple of questions. Well, first of all, um, how much of the actual adult population of investors own Bitcoin. So it's a percentage of investors owning Bitcoin is another, is another, I think, ratio we need to look at. And second, how many people are actually using Bitcoin as a form of payment and whether or not you think that role can expand? Because if you look at all these other things, you can actually use the telephone, electricity, all these are appliances or utilities that you can use in your everyday life, most of them at least. Bitcoin, I don't think has gotten there yet for most people. Um, and until we see Bitcoin being used to, you know, uh, as, as an integral part of everyday transactions, I, 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 I hesitate to say that it's going to be adopted as widely, let's say, an iPhone. What do you think? What's your take? Well, I, I spent eight years in San Francisco, the quintessential gold rush city of the world. <laughs> and we would, all say, we would all say that gold is unanimously called money. It is the quintessential sure. form of money. Nowhere in the former gold rush city of the world can I spend gold. But gold is still valuable because gold is used as a store of value. So money has three functions, a store of value, medium of exchange, and that's your common like transacted everyday currency, and mm -hmm. unit of account. Unit yes. of account is I go to the grocery store and the labels are in dollars. Sure. A new money has to go through stages. If people don't want to transact with it or price things in it, if they don't first own it. So we have to go through the store of value era. And that's where Bitcoin is in that era right now, becoming globally recognized as a gold 2.0. And we've seen Jerome Powell, chairman of the Federal Reserve, mention this, that Bitcoin is a speculative store value asset. And so Bitcoin first has to be adopted to such a degree that a high percentage of the population owns it. And then over time, as it becomes much more liquid, even bigger in the tens of trillions market cap, it becomes more liquid and more stable in terms of price because it has matured to a very large store of value asset. In those moments when market penetration is high and volatility is low, then it, transact, then it transitions to the medium of account and unit of exchange era where yes. people are like, cool, I own Bitcoin. I've owned it for five years. You know, and the price hasn't, you know, price is stable now. It's at a million dollars in Bitcoin and has been for, 
10 years or something or five mm-hmm. years and you're like, okay, well, now I think of it as my, my mindset now is in the, the Bitcoin era of, oh, that's priced in X amount of sats, which is one one hundredth of a millionth of Bitcoin. Okay. So that takes a lot of time. So we're, we're good at least five to 15 years away from that era. So Dan, let's assume then that the adoption rate of Bitcoin is currently at 10% of the U.S. adult population. And let's also make the assumption that it'll one day go to 100%. Can we then say that the Bitcoin price is currently only at 10% of its maturity? In other words, we're at what? Just just shy of $40,000. Let's use $40,000, for example. Is that 10% of the the full value of Bitcoin? Can I make that assumption? I think that's a little too linear because the the penetration, the market penetration in the U.S. is much higher than the rest of the world. So we would need, the, the U.S. is a very small percentage of the world population. So that would be number one. Number two is what percentage of their net worth do they have in Bitcoin? It's probably very, very low, like one to 5%. Um, and then also we have the institutions. So the institutions, um, they manage trillions of tens of trillions of dollars worth of assets across the world. They are also a bidder. And then you also have central banks. Central banks at one point could decide to back their currency with Bitcoin. Uh, they current, many of these uh, were, Many of these government reserves have gold, so this would not be out of the out of the realm of possibility of them taking tens or hundreds of billions of dollars and using that to buy Bitcoin. So Bitcoin market participants include those retail traders, institutions and governments. We haven't seen the governments come in. We've just started to see the institutions come in. And even on the retail side, it's less than like 10 percent. OK, so then what is your estimate as to what the full value of Bitcoin should be at this point. I mean, let's assume that it's undervalued. Um, what, you know, what, what percentage of the full value are we currently at? If you have, if you have such a number. There's, it's a, it's a wild, wild range of numbers, but I think Bitcoin's <laughs> market capitalization should be between um, 10 and 200 trillion would be the more, the most appropriate wow. valuation. It doesn't, isn't that like larger, come on. So we've got a couple of different ways. is larger it. than the world GDP, isn't it? I think. Well, here's a couple of different ways to think about it. Uh, one, right. so we, we would need to look at the TAM, total addressable market of store value assets, right? We've got gold. Gold is at, I was at, I think, 10 to $12 trillion right now. It's aggregate value of all gold in the world. Yeah. So that would be gold. Then you have fiat currency. Okay. So fiat currency, I think, is approximately 40 to $50 trillion. Then you've got yeah. sovereign debt. Um, sovereign debt is used as a store of value. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Bitcoin doesn't singularly just compete with gold. It competes with any other. And, and gold similarly doesn't compete with just fiat. It competes with all other stores of value. And then you've got real estate, which is a very common store of value asset across the world. And that's a $250 trillion market. Note that all of these are inherent, have inherently weaker characteristics as a store of value asset than Bitcoin. None of them are digitally native. Um, they can, a lot of them can be seized and, and censored. Um, there's other things that you can't do with them as well. There's, they're not divisible. Um, they're not very durable. And so Bitcoin, in terms of its monetary attributes, make it a very, uh, a very, very sexy store of value asset to where Bitcoin ultimately at some point competes with real estate as well. I mean, we've seen real estate prices wow. in the U.S. go up 23% year over year. It's not because twenty three percent. It's not because the home be, homes became twenty three percent had twenty three percent more utility. It was twenty three percent more be, due to inflation concerns being baked into the price, uh, supply issues as well. So you've got tightening supply, increased demand to use it as a store value asset. Cities like San Francisco, New York, and London, double digit percentages of those apartments and homes in those cities are literally empty because they're just used as a store value asset. So if we were to properly evaluate Bitcoin's TAM, that's the banded range between, I would say like 20 trillion and 200 trillion. So somewhere in there, which makes the price of Bitcoin, you know, in in the millions is is where I think it would be appropriately priced a long term. Now, I'm not saying that this is gonna happen over the next year. This would be over a very long duration. 20 to 40 in today's dollars. Right. Of course. Okay. All right. So yeah, adjusted for inflation, of course, millions of dollars. So all right. So all right. So let's let me give you one counter argument, and you can tell me where maybe I'm getting this wrong. Let's, can we go back to the adoption chart real quick? I'm noticing here that most of these technologies, as they become more adopted by more people, they become also cheaper, and I would say one could argue less valuable because it's more commonplace. Once upon a time, it was very difficult to make a call 
long distance. Nowadays, it's virtually free. Same thing with air travel. Same thing with basically everything else I see on this chart. So what's stopping me from making the argument that as Bitcoin becomes more adopted by end users, it becomes less valuable as a less sexy, so to speak, as an asset, less people, you know, less people would assign higher value to it. And probably would probably be as transactions as protocols, second layer protocols get developed, transactions get made through Bitcoin, uh, the cost of transactions become cheaper. And so the price should, in theory, fall. Am I, am I getting this wrong, Dan? Yeah, I think so, because inherently money is a network effect. Um, okay. The cost to do something or is somewhat tied to the utility of Bitcoin is in storing value in it. Now, I think okay. you're asking about the transaction costs. Well, with layer two technology, transaction costs can decrease while adoption increases, such as Lightning. Lightning is a layer two tech where it costs very, very, it's a very, very cheap way to transact. Um, we're talking hundreds of, or thousandth of a penny to move a large amount of value. So from the raw utility of being able to move it, now storing value in it, you only need to move it once. But if you want to move it many times, layer two technology is enabled to become cheaper to move around uh, as more and more people adopt it. So that's not a big concern. Um, also, money is a network effect, which means that as it grows in value, it becomes more valuable for all market participants, including new ones. Mm -hmm. New ones might complain, oh, I didn't get in early or oh, I didn't see it early. But that's immaterial because they need to use it for its properties as a money. Bitcoin's properties as a money, like I said, said before, it's a digitally and native asset. There's no trust required with any institution to send it. And it's, it's immutable. It's not censorable. And the monetary policy cannot be changed. So due to those factors, people, even if there is no price appreciation in Bitcoin, the value to hold it and use it because it's immutable and because no one can take it away from you is immensely valuable. Right. I, I guess maybe it's, maybe it's unfair to compare it to some forms of technology then because it is fundamentally not um, an appliance to be used. It's, it's a form of money. Uh, if you were to make that assumption, it has to have the properties of money. And so therefore, it, the properties of money are fundamentally different than properties of new technology. And so maybe, maybe the adoption curve would look different. Uh, maybe we should be comparing it to the adoption curve of, let's say, um, uh, other forms of currency or perhaps even uh, perhaps uh, gold or something. It would, be, it would be cool to have the gold data. You know, there was a transition yeah, it would period. Be thousands from, of, yeah. <laughs> I don't thousands think we have any records that go back that far, but I'm sure there was a conversation to be had between folks who had other assets like shells and beads, and, and they could argue the, sure. the traits of those were superior than gold. And I'm sure these conversations happen just like that too. So <laughs> unfortunately, the record doesn't go back that far, but uh, we, can, right. we can be sure that humans were speculating on gold's potential as a store of value asset. And we've seen that with other metals. Silver, right? Silver yeah. is a commonly used one to, for people to speculate that, oh, there might be a biometallic sort of standard. Um, so, yeah, we've certainly seen speculation and we've seen adoption mm -hmm. curves of other precious metals as uh, store of values. Okay. Um, finally, let's talk about regulation. There's been a trend of tightening of regulation all around the world. Earlier this year, Turkey banned crypto cryptocurrencies as a form of payment. China started cracking down on its miners recently. And of course, uh, a couple weeks ago, Binance was recently unauthorized by the Italian officials. But what's going on here? It's all happening this year, by the way. Well, you know, the ban in India actually happened last year. So that's, that's somewhat, you know, these, these bans occur right. every year in different countries. I think okay. this year, you're right, there's, there's a higher frequency of them than usual. So um, a lot of different geopolitical things at play here. With uh, what's going on in Europe and Binance, I think Binance was playing hard and fast with the rules. I Look, I used to work with CZ back at blockchain.com. I think he's a great leader. I think he's an exceptional thinker. Their, his strategy was a little bit more aggressive than other companies like Kraken. Where Kraken and Coinbase, we play by the rules. We follow all the different local regulations that we need to. So I don't think that's like a, a necessarily a broad shutdown of crypto. I think that's a representation of the crypto wild west era might be over. And so that's what we're seeing in Europe right now, because we haven't had any issues yet. Um, with countries banning Bitcoin completely, like countries like China, China banning Bitcoin, that narrative has actually occurred over 50 times in the last uh, 10 years uh, that China was banning Bitcoin. 
what actually was occurring is a wide variety of different types of smaller bands, um, prohibited, mm-hmm. prohibited uh, nature, like prohibited types of, of things you could do with it. This le- latest one was banning Bitcoin mining. Yes. Um, I would say that that was a, a big boon for the industry because a lot of people's concerns over Bitcoin were that there are a lot of Bitcoin miners in China and that they use dirty electricity. And now that both of those concerns have been defeated because there are no more, more miners in China. Also, when we saw the miners in China leave, we found that they only had around 35 to 40 percent of the network, which miners don't control Bitcoin, by the way. They're more of like the paid guards to ensure mm-hmm. that the ordering of transaction goes properly. But it does, um, you know, kind of defeats that FUD or that fear, uncertainty, and doubt around China and Bitcoin. Right. Now, when we look at what does the future hold, I think that's probably the, the deeper question here. How will governments respond as Bitcoin grows in adoption? Well, inherently, Bitcoin and government monies compete. So they should be uh, hesitant to embrace it to, in some degree. However, what happens when 40% of your population owns it? These include politicians and police and military and investigators at different tax agencies. When that occurs, it becomes very problematic to be able to do anything in terms of banning it or removing it because 40% of the population now believes it. And if you were a politician to vote for something like that, you would not be voted in because people vote with their pocketbook and you've just made them much poorer. Also, the level of compliance would likely be low and compliance as in individual wallet users voluntarily providing information or um, adhering to different different policies. If you, uh, you know, if you make a policy so unpopular that most of the population doesn't like it, is that really a law if everyone just breaks it? So um, Bitcoin's protection against government shutting it down is a function of, of adoption. As it grows more in adoption, it becomes harder and harder to isolate those people that would believe in it and penalize them or, or try to remove Bitcoin. Uh, just one more point, and I'll let you go, Dan. The uh, the skeptics of Bitcoin will point to tighter regulations as a reason to not own Bitcoin. If you take a look at uh, China's uh, shutdown of the miners, for example, what we saw immediately was a decline in the hash rate, uh, a drop that we haven't seen in a long time of that scale. And if you overlay the hash rate drop to a chart of the Bitcoin price, you can see, again, correlation is not causation except according except according to the Texas professors there. But uh, but uh, you, you could definitely see a correlation there. So what I'm trying to say is whether or not uh, – I'm trying to ask you whether or not regulations as a whole are a tailwind or a headwind for Bitcoin. Definitely a headwind, right? Any increased regulatory crackdown means – harder participation uh, means more negativity. Um, All prices across the world for any asset reflect information of what people's aggregate belief or sentiment is around the asset. If news is bullish about Apple, then the price is likely to continue to climb as people, people become more bullish. With Bitcoin, it's the same thing. Regulatory news is typically negative. Now, there are some instances where regulators become more permissive or give very clear guidance, and that reduces an uncertainty. So I would say regulatory uncertainty is probably the most negative type of news. Regulatory certainty that's not too restrictive or really clamps down, I think is positive news because it clears that up for everyone else. Excellent. Dan, I want to thank you so much for coming to the show today. Excellent thoughts. Thank you for your time. I look forward to speaking with you again soon. It was fun. Yeah, that was great. Really appreciated the questions and, um, you know, love the deep, I love the deep dive on the stuff. I think that we covered a lot of different topics, especially Absolutely. what I see with my audience. These are some common questions. So, um, yeah, thanks for having me on. And, uh, where can people read more about your work? Uh, Dan, what can people learn more from the held report? Yeah. If you want my short form thoughts, follow me on Twitter. I'm at Dan held on Twitter. So those are my kind of quick snippet thoughts. If you want to hear my longer form thinking, The Held Report is a weekly newsletter that I put out on every Thursday. So if you subscribe to that uh, on the free tier, you get that once a month. On the paid tier, you get that once a week. So those are kind of fun because I, on Twitter, I only have a certain amount of character length to be able to talk about a topic. Mm-hmm. But uh, via this, I'm able to dig in super deep. Okay. And what's your Twitter handle? At Dan Held. Okay, excellent. All right. Don't forget to uh, follow Dan on Twitter and uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. And follow me at DavidLynn underscore TV. Thank you for watching. <laughs>